You need to know that it shine. Anything you wanna be, be. Cause you give me So glad you all came in today. I'm Bev Spivey. I co-minister here with my wonderful husband, Reverend Lawrence Palmer. We give you our greeting today and shout out to our live streamers. Please feel part of this spiritual community. It's good to see some friends visiting with us today. And those of you that come down from up north and down south, <laughs> thanks for joining us today. 
we know that there's something here for each and every one of us. So as we begin today, Rita's approaching to light the candles. <laughs> we thank our ushers and our greeters and all of our volunteers who see that we're ship shape around here. I want to uh, introduce our illustrious band under the direction of James McCoy. Good morning. We're very fortunate to have Mr. Peter Wallace at the piano with us this morning. And we have Mr. Jeff Renza at the drum set. And our featured soloist is Miss Samantha Natalie Wallace. And you'll notice they do have the same last name. They are married as well. Just people who serve here are just all, they're just married too. And in fact, the entire Wallace clan is here. Yes, we have music from, who do we have music from today? Oh yes, Whitney Houston, that's right. Okay, well our theme for the year has been one humanity and many stories. So today, as we go about, it's a big day for us. We have potluck, we have annual meeting. You will notice our wonderful Radiance Satterfield with her camera. I think Dina and Radiance, and I don't know who all had the bright idea that we have so many of us here with so many different stories, and we're not going to ask you to write out your stories, but we are going to put your picture around our bulletin board so we get to know each other by name. So when you see Radiant snapping photos today, just know that you're invited to get your picture taken for the border that's going to be made around our bulletin board. As we share in that oneness of knowing that we are all here, no matter what path we took to get here, here we are in life with our story being part of that one humanity, and we bless each other with that. So as we start today, we also remember it's still the month of February where we've been focusing on love. So join me please in this affirmation for living love. Together, I am a living, loving expression of God right here and now. And in that expression, we look at our vision here at Unity of Pompano Beach together, centered in God, we create an ever-expanding spiritual community of one. And what is our mission? What do we do with this vision together? We are a spiritual beacon of inspiration, abundance, and enlightenment. So let's pray into those ideas as we take a breath and feel ourselves full of God's breath, God's energy, God's thoughts, as we use our mind within the one mind. And we blow out our breath and we cleanse our body of the toxins from breathing and living. And we also make a decision to cleanse our mind of the negativity and any things that are holding us back from being that expression of love in this life. For we know that we are peace, that we can feel and be peace every moment of every day. And with grateful hearts and minds for this place in which we can thrive and learn and grow and share, we give great thanks, and so it is. Amen. And our prayer today is our statement of peace. Won't you join me in praying this? Unity of Pompano, a member of Unity Worldwide Ministries, stands for peace in the presence of conflict, for love in the presence of hatred, for forgiveness in the presence of injury. Unity honors the many names for God, the many paths to God, the many ways to worship God. For there is only one power and presence of God 
and that God loves each one of us equally. We urge all nations, their leaders, and their people to turn to God by whatever the name for guidance during these challenging times and pursue peace, not war, for this is what honors the God of all our faith traditions. Unity stands for peace in our lifetime, and so it is. Let's all stand now and remember to love. It's another one of those songs we got from Ricky Byers Beckworth out there in Los Angeles, the Agape Choir. You don't even need to look at the words, I'm telling you. You don't even need to look. You'll sing it two times and you'll have it. So let's all sing. Michelle, turn it off. Start loving me. One more time. want you to know that if you are here for the first time, we would like you to know that you indeed are welcome. And if you would please raise your hand, our ushers have a welcome brochure for you. Anybody here for the first time? Welcome very much. You're very welcome. Welcome, welcome. And you have picked the right day to be here because we've got a wonderful potluck luncheon, don't we? How many brought some food today? Oh, it's looking good, James. <laughs> Lawrence brought his confetti cake trifle, so allow room in your belly for a little bit of dessert. It's the confetti cake trifle? Oh, yes. It's I not the Dorito surprise? No. Okay. <laughs> confetti cake trifle. Well, if you are here, we want you to feel welcome. We also invite everybody to come over to fellowship following this service for our wonderful potluck. We dine together on the days of our annual meeting, and this happens to be annual meeting day. So come for that. We also want you to know that prayer is very important here, and we have prayer chaplains available for you. Don't wait for a crisis in your life. Take advantage of unity prayer, which is always very positive and uplifting. So for a half hour before this service, beginning at 10.30 every week, there will be a chaplain in the first room on the right, our prayer chapel, where you may pray with that chaplain, or they will sit quietly while you want some silent prayer yourself. So take advantage of that time. They are also available after each service. They'll stand in the side aisles and be available for prayer with you. 
And today, of course, is our annual meeting. The instructions for that are that if you are not a member, you are still welcome to attend. You will just not have any voting privileges or be able to speak and add any comments, but certainly you are welcome to come and see what goes on here. Everybody is to come through those front doors. In fact, these side doors will be locked because we do this official with our bylaws and we will ask each member to sign in. Uh, the list is there. You simply come through those doors and sign in and come on into the meeting. We will ask your help in cleaning up our potluck and allowing everybody time to get over here. Uh, we will start at one o'clock and we can Go over later and finish the cleanup, whatever is needed. So those of you who are our wonderful fellowship uh, volunteers and, and sacred service with our food, we ask that you come on over and enjoy the annual meeting as well, and we'll all help clean up afterwards. Crucial Conversations is a class that I am really excited about teaching beginning March 5th. The uh, promo is on our website, and I ask that you go there, click on the link. It will take you to a form that you can fill out, and it will give me an idea of how much to prepare as far as handouts and copies go. There's no obligation for registering, but we ask that you register. There is an option there uh, where you can bring in your check or cash to the church uh, if you choose to just pay week by week. But for those who know they want to come and be part of the group, you get a $10 discount by paying online by cash when you register. So for seven weeks, um, it's $10 a night or $60 if you prepay. This is a class that I can't think of anybody who wouldn't benefit. We all have interactions, whether uh, it's with family, neighbors, friends, work, even church, um, and there are those times when you're in a conversation and suddenly your whole body gives you red flags of some sort and you realize you're in it. And uh, those are difficult to maneuver through, and we all have our style of getting through it one way or the other, and those who are in relationship know that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So I would encourage you to take a look at the two books online Nonviolent Communication and Crucial Conversations. You may buy them used, uh, get them from a friend, or buy them new, but please come to class prepared for some really work because like so many things in Unity, we take this to a deeper level. This isn't just about tools of saying, when you do this, I feel this. We've had those kinds of trainings. This goes a step deeper into how you manage yourself and maneuver through these crucial conversations for success. If you're in business at all, if you have a job that involves any other person, I would suggest to come and take this course. Okay, today's our uh, potluck here, but we always have a March, uh, we always have a potluck breakfast for members the first Sunday, the first Saturday of every month. This isn't because it's exclusive uh, to members. It's because that's the only accurate list we have to send out prayer letters and invite. So members hold each other in prayer throughout the day uh, on a monthly basis, and we have a breakfast together. And because we're all going to be cruising to Cuba, woo, and uh, returning on uh, March the first Saturday in March. The breakfast is postponed till April. Okay. Women of Unity. Wonderful addition to our women's retreat is Jan Kinder. Those that came to the Women of Unity meeting, uh, their monthly meeting, got to experience her. She is wonderful. A nurse with special skills in color and vibration and healing therapies, and she's just very excellent and is coming to our women's retreat along with the others. So again, go to our website, read all about it, and sign up. This is
probably about the last week when you can sign up and full payment is going to be due as well because we're due at Duncan Center on March 23rd. It'll be a Friday evening and all day Saturday until uh, evening. So come out, women. It's a wonderful time to be together. Invite any other women friends. Uh, it's great for all of us. We have daily words available, $6. They are in large print, and it's a uh, two-month edition. So they're available in our used bookstore, which is right through that garden door. And we encourage you to browse through the used bookstore. So with that being said, I want to announce that we had some new members. Uh-oh. What happened to our slide? Well, we had uh, new members that attended orientation last Sunday. Here we go. Uh, and Anthony, Diana, and Diana are all traveling. So we are postponing the usual installation of members that we do on the stage and anointing them. But I do want to introduce Liz because she is here. So. Elizabeth Harlow, welcome. So let's all stand and greet Liz and each other. Let's all sing. We weave, weave us together. Weave us together, together in And when the music stops, we all sit back down. Thank you.
Good morning. I'm John Fitzgerald. I'm the treasurer of, of Unity, and I'm reading the uh, whatever <laughs> the Daily Word. Uh, I had. I have faith that I am divinely guided. Today, I consider the path that has brought me to this moment. Looking back at past situations, I now see that seemingly insurmountable obstacles held rich new opportunities to allow my Christ self to guide my every choice. Divine guidance is never withheld and is more rewarding than any scenarios my mortal mind may envision. Just as I encourage others to actively seek enlightenment from their inner source, I remind myself to do the same. Spiritual guidance is readily available to me and to all creation through a divine connection. Through spirit within, my perspective changes and possibilities become reality. I have faith that I am divinely, divinely guided. Right now, as the prayer chest comes forward, we'd like to begin a time of prayer and meditation by singing together, I am love. I appreciate Shelley sharing with us the crystal bowl this morning during our meditation time. As we've come into this place this morning, we've had so many things happening during this week. Most of you have been busy about many things. Some of you had a wonderful week. Some had a frustrating week. Some of you accomplished many things, and some of you have left many things unaccomplished. But in a sense, all of that is irrelevant to this moment because we are here in this experience that we call home. Not only in this place, but in your heart as well. You are invited, you are encouraged to turn your attention to home and nowhere else. That place within you where you so completely and clearly meet spirit. So I invite you to allow your body to become still and settle into that stillness. You can give your body permission to relax. Give your mind permission to relax so that there's nothing to do, there's nothing to think about, but just to be. And with body at ease and mind at ease, your awareness is free to commune with spirit. And that is your communion with spirit, not like anybody else's, not like anybody tells you to, but what works for you. 
where you find, you experience, you know that connection, that oneness with Source. And in that place of communion, we can play, we can be still, we can heal, we can learn and grow. All these experiences happening in your home, in your heart. So let us join together in the stillness.
Now as you prepare to move your awareness back to your body, back to this time and space, you know that even an instant during which your awareness is immersed in that deep of your heart into home, that healing and transformation take place. And you know that you can bring with you into your body, your mind, your heart, the essence of this experience, that time in the stillness, that time of sensing the vibration of the bowl. And in this coming week, as you choose to, you can simply take a moment and recall this experience and be blessed all over again. So with a deep sense of gratitude for this opportunity of being together in this way, I invite you to take a deep, slow breath in through your nose, hold it for a moment, and exhale slowly, deliberately through your mouth. And when you're ready, open your eyes and we will sing together, Alleluia. in this world we all want our voices to be heard everyone wants a chance to be someone we all have dreams we need to dream sweeter than any star you can reach cause when you reach and find you found some You'll hold this world's most priceless thing The greatest gift this life can bring Is when you look back and know That you were loved You were loved by someone Touched by someone Held by someone Meant something to someone Loved somebody touch somebody's heart along the way you can look back and say that you you were loved you can have diamonds in your hands have all the riches of the land but without love you really don't have a thing no you and somebody cares that you're alive and somebody trusts you with their life that's when you'll know that you have all you need you priceless thing the greatest treasure that there is you can look back and know that you were loved you were loved by someone touched by someone held by someone meant something to someone loved somebody touched somebody's heart you 
Samantha Natalie, the music of Whitney Houston. Samantha, how old were you when you started singing? How long? Six? When, when you did your first public performance, how old were you? I just had this picture flash in my mind as she was up here singing of her being a little girl with a white dress on just singing away. Glad you started. Very good. Thank you again. Well, the theme for this year is what? Many stories, which make me very happy. And I promise you that during this year, one Sunday a month, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to use a story out of the Bible as the point of the sermon. And today I want to take a story out of the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And actually it's part of a series of stories. As you know, Jesus was a master storyteller. Uh, they were called parables. Uh, parable is just a story with a, with a meaningful punchline, basically. And Jesus was going about doing his thing. He was preaching and teaching and healing. And the scribes and the Pharisees were giving him a hard time, which was nothing new. That happened a lot. But they were criticizing Jesus because he hung out with the undesirable folks. He hung out with the Gentiles and the sinners and kind of liked them. And the scribes and Pharisees just wanted to throw them away and forget about them. And Jesus told a series of stories here, a series of parables about things that were lost. First, there was a story about the sheep that was lost. How many of you remember Tennessee Ernie Ford? Remember him? Oh, wonderful. The 90 and 9, you remember that story about the sheep? The 90 and 9 were safe in the fold. Go back and listen to it. Um, it's about the one sheep that got lost and what happened when the one sheep was lost. The shepherd packed up the rest of them and went looking for the one until it was found and celebrated when it was found. Jesus followed that with a story about the lost coin. A woman had 10 coins. She lost one and she cleaned her whole house and brought in her neighbors and had a search party going on to try to find that lost coin and there was a celebration when the lost coin was found. And the third story was what we call the prodigal son. Now just a little bit of trivia here. You will not find the word prodigal in the Bible, not in the text. It's sometimes they, when they print the Bible up and give headings to the chapters, they'll put prodigal son in there. But prodigal is not part of the story. It's the lost son. And just with the other two, the punchline of this story is that there was a son that was lost and he was found and there was great celebrating. Now in this story about the lost son or prodigal son, as you may be more comfortable with. There are three main characters. There's a father and two sons. Now the first character that shows up here is the young son. He's a hot shot. Too big for his britches. Thinks he knows everything. Uh, everybody in the world but him is stupid. Uh, some of you are looking sheepish as if you have been there or have known someone who was there. But the young man goes to his father and says, hey look, I'm ready to blow this joint. 
I want my money, give me my inheritance, and I'm out of here. I'm gone. I, got, I see bigger things out there for me. So his father said, okay. Gave, cut the, the inheritance in half, gave him his half, and sent him on his way. And the young man went out with riotous living, as one translation of the scriptures go. He found some ne'er-do-well friends and hung out with them. I have a little uh, different take on the story. Um, and you can feel free to add to the story as you would like, because there's a lot of white space, you know, in between the lines. And you can make it what you want. And there have been a lot of different interpretations of this particular story. But I got the idea this young man went out and he hung out with a fast crowd. He had fast camels. And, um, <laughs> but he wasn't completely stupid because he hung out with some really guys that were really smart. These guys all had money and that's what kind of brought them together. But one of them was a COO and one of them was a CEO and one was a CFO of their father's companies. And they knew some stuff and the young man listened when he was hanging around with them. However, he wasn't very thrifty and wise with his money and he blew it all. It was gone. And there was a famine in the land, so food was scarce and everything else was scarce. And he found himself eating out of a hog's trough, eating what the pigs ate, locust uh, uh, beans out of the hog trough, which is not a very pleasant experience. Any of you ever been around hogs, you know that's not a real appetizing thing to do. And while he had his face down in the trough with the hogs, he said, whoa, I don't really want to be this live this way. There's a better way to do this. In my father's house, even the servants are better off than this. So I'm going to get myself up. I'm going to go home. I'm going to follow my face. I'm going to apologize to my father, tell him I'm not worthy to be called his son, and ask if I can work as a servant in my father's house. So up he got and went back home. Evidently, the father now has been watching and waiting for the, fa for the son to return home. I suspect the father may have had a similar experience when he was young because he didn't throw the son away. He didn't, didn't forget about him. He didn't hope he never showed up again. He was watching every day, waiting for his son to appear on the horizon on his way home. And one day he looked up and there he saw in the distance his son coming. And the father didn't stand and wait for the son to get to him. What happened? What did the story say? The father ran to meet him, ran to meet him, grabbed him, hugged him, Kissed him, you're home, you're home. And he said, bring the ring, a family crest, which gave authority. Bring the robe and put on him. Kill the fatted calf, let's plan for a party. That which is lost, my son the lost is now found. And we're going to have a party. And the young man was brought back home once again and found in the embrace of his father. Now there's a third character in this story, and that is the older son. The older son was so thrilled when the younger brother got home, right? Uh, he was royally ticked off. Right? Because his, the, the older brother had been there all the time. He's the one that held the fort down. He's the one that managed everything. He's the one that was dutiful. He did exactly what he was supposed to do. Everything his father asked, he did. And when his father said, come on into the party, he said, no, I'm not coming in there. And his father said, well, Why? And the, young, the, son, the older son said, I've been here. I've served you loyally. You never gave me a party. And here it is, this punk who ran off and wasted his money and come back home. And you're throwing a party for him. No, I'm not going in there. And it doesn't say what happened after that. Interesting that story just kind of stopped there with the younger son being welcomed home. And I really got, to, got to kind of hung up on this older son. I got thinking about that. What was going on with him? What, what kind of lesson is there that we can get from the older son? We, we got the one from the younger son. When you wake up, you do what's right. You go back and you repent and things can be healed. We got that from the, the, the younger son. We got from the father, we got the sense of forgiveness and understanding. That's part of the story. But I've never heard anybody really give a good lesson from the older son, except to put him down and say he was a bad person because he, he wasn't happy that his brother was home. Well, let's take a look at that. What was going on there? What was the dynamic that might have been operating here? The father said to the older son, you have always been here and everything that is mine is yours. The older son was denied nothing. He had access to everything the younger one did. Everything I have is yours, and you've always been here. 
a little boring, but you've always been here. You know, you're very dependable, and you've always been here. So there was nothing going on that got the father's attention except his son did what he was supposed to do while gritting his teeth. The older son wasn't happy doing what he was doing. That seems obvious from, from the context of the story. The older son was doing what he was supposed to do because he thought that's what he was supposed to do. He wasn't doing it because he wanted to. He wasn't doing it because he found joy. He wasn't doing it because he was authentic. He was doing it because he thought he should. And he was expecting to be rewarded for doing what he should. But he wasn't. No party. No fatted calf killed for him. No big celebration for him. Just go ahead and keep doing your duty. But he wasn't happy. And another thing I suspect was going on is that he was just a tad envious of his younger brother and jealous of him. Not because of what he had, but because of what he did. The younger brother stood up and said, hey, this is me. He was a little stupid at the moment, but he was authentic in that. He stood up and said, this is what I want, and I'll take it, and I'm going to go do something with it. And at some point, the younger brother said, ooh, I messed up. I'm going to get up. I'm going to go return the same way I left with myself, being authentic. This is what I want. I wanted to go and have a great time out in the world. I did it. Now I want to go home, and he did it. The younger son was doing exactly what he wanted to do. The older son was doing nothing he wanted to do. And he wasn't happy about that. So it seemed like the lesson for us here as we look at these two brothers, and especially the older brother, is this matter of what is it that you want to do? Any of you have or have been, or maybe even now, you're just doing what you're supposed to do. You're doing what's expected of you, maybe what's required of you, but it's not what you want to do. The younger brother stood up and said, this is what I want. The older brother said, I'm not even going to think about what I want. And he was miserable and he was boring and he was just there. Now, what if we were to take a lesson from the younger brother and begin to look at what I really want? There's a, a program that I have that I, I teach periodically. It's called Credo Cupido Sio. Credo, you may have heard of before. It's the word from which we get creed. I mean, credo is a Latin phrase that means I believe. So this credo process is where you look at what you say you believe and what you really believe as a part of growth. And when I would teach that, it always felt incomplete. And then I realized there's another component to it, and that is what do you want? In addition to what you believe shaping your life, what you want shapes your life. And cupido is the word from which we get cupid, you know, the little fat little baby that's angel that flies around shooting arrows at people, making them fall in love. Well, cupido means I desire, I want, I long for. And then sio is the word for science, which means to know. So if we come to a place where we really examine what we believe, we really examine what we want, and really examine what we know, we're going to be a little further down the road. But let's look at that matter of what I want. How many of you as a child or since then, have ever really been rewarded for saying, I want this. You picture a child stomping their feet saying, I want it, right? Because they couldn't have it. And what does that do to us? It says, don't do that. Don't want. And even if you do want, don't say that you want. And we see, that where, we see where that gets you. The younger brother wanted and expressed it. The older brother wanted and wouldn't even look at it, wouldn't even think about it. So what if we look at ourselves and say, what do I really want? What do I want out of life? What do I want for my life? What do I want to do with myself? How many of you have ever been in, don't raise your hand, but how many of you ever been in a job that you absolutely hated and you wanted to do something else? What do you want? You wanted something else. And you hear the stories, the inspiring stories, a lot of them were in Chicken Soup for the Soul books about people who had some job doing this making lots of money and everything else, being miserable, and they walked away from it to go raise chickens out in the country or something. And that's a silly example, but it's true. What happens when we wake up and say, I want this? 
I want to be able to go to sleep at night with peace in my heart. I want to be able to wake up with peace in my heart. I want to be able to do something with my skill and my mind and my energy that does something good for someone else. That's what I want. And everything that you want has a price tag attached to it. And very often we think the price tag is too big for what I want. But it's nothing compared to the price tag of not admitting and pursuing what you want. That one is much bigger. It's much more subtle in cost, but it's there nevertheless. So if we come to the place as part of our spiritual beingness, as part of our, our, our character, our nature, our being, and we ask ourselves, what do I want? Right here, right now. For myself, for my world, for those that I love, what do I want? And be willing to stand in that authenticity and saying, this is what I want. And maybe nobody else in the world who will agree with you, maybe nobody else in the world who will support you, but you are able to say, I want want this and I will have it. Now we can look at this story as a story in history with historical characters in it or we can look at it metaphysically. What an interesting thing to do, right? If we look at this story metaphysically, all the characters are you. All the characters are parts of you. The uh, younger brother who acts impetuously, that's a part of you. The older brother who's stodgy, stick in the mud, that's a part of you too. And the, and the father who forgives and welcomes back is a part of you as well. So what I would say to you is that when you start playing this story out and you, you come to the place of being willing to look at yourself and say, what do I want? And then be able to stand up and say, this is what I want what you will find is that higher part of yourself, the father in the story, who says, welcome home. Be who you are, and I will affirm that. I will celebrate that. I can assure you that saying, oh, I don't want anything, and oh, I shouldn't want that, will bring you no joy, will bring you no peace, will bring you no power. In contrast to say, this is what I want. It is rising up from within me. It is a part of who I am as much as my breath. This is what I want and this is what I will have. And I will assure you there you will find joy and peace and power. The story is about a lost son who was found. And we often think that's the younger one. But the possibilities for this story, and a story never ends. It goes on and on. There was a line in a movie one time, I cannot remember the movie, I can see the scene in my head. But somebody asked about the ending of the story, and the punchline was, the story's not over yet. So the story for the older son is not over yet when we read it. I see him as saying, wow, I've learned something here. I've seen what happened with my younger brother. I've seen what happened with my father. And I'm going to do something different here because this is what I want. And this is what I am going to have. And I'm going to make it happen. And I see him going on and becoming a vibrant part of that family. And being an important part of his younger brother's life and the life of his father. Because he said, I want this. And it came from his heart. Would you be so bold? Would you dare do such a thing? To feel something that bucks all tradition? To feel something that goes against societal norms or family norms or what's expected of you? Just to say, I want it. Just, just start there. That terrifies some of you. To say, I want this. But then take it to the next step and say, I will have this. I realized at some point that I wanted to be a unity minister. I was a Baptist minister, well established with my reputation, my networking, everything else. And I one day said, <laughs> here's the truth. I want to be a unity minister and I will be a unity minister. So I walked away from all of that, all of my Baptist connections, moved my family, went back to school 
and I became a unity minister. There was a price tag attached to that, but it was worth it. Because to not have done that would have been contrary to what I'd come to see as my own nature, my own sense of self. So whatever it is you may be playing with, struggling with, regarding what you want, be true to your nature. Be true to your heart. Be true to the Father, that higher consciousness within you that guides you and affirms you and celebrates you and welcomes you. This is what I want and I will have it. God bless you in that. You are here today because a group of us in 2010 said, this is what we want. And I'd ask you to think about what you want in your spiritual life right now. Maybe many times you said, oh, this, that, and the other, and nah, nah, but I'm too busy to go to class and whatever. No, it's here for you. We're here for you, for each other, to grow, to learn, to find that comfort and peace within that comes from our higher power. So I encourage you to realize the value here and take advantage of it. We welcome your gifts. We thank you for them. We are totally supported by you. So thank you for your giving. Thank you for your service. Thank you for just being you. So let's bless our gift today. With a grateful heart, I acknowledge God as source of all that is. Today, I declare love for myself and all others. Love is mine. Love and more love is mine. An ever-increasing love is mine. Everywhere I go, I see this love. I feel it. I experience it. I freely give it, and it multiplies itself around me. And so it is. Amen. So since it's Love Month, we thought what a great way to close out the month with the classic from Jackie Wilson.
Okay, so you're one in a million boys, too. I'm no longer proofreading the lyrics. <laughs> we get a good laugh out of everything here, so let's whip our arms around each other and enjoy this spiritual community. Invite all of you to stay for the potluck, to come on over for the annual meeting, and participate in the leadership and ownership of this organization. So our chaplains are in place to pray with you. And remember, photos are going to be taken in Fellowship Hall. And just enjoy, enjoy the week and the months and the years ahead. Let's stand and bless each other in closing. The light of God surrounds us. I am the light of God. The love of God enfolds us. I am the love of God. The power of God protects us. I am the power of God. The presence of God watches over us. I am the presence of God. Wherever we are, God is, and all is well. God bless you, everyone. Have a great week.